welcoming you. Uh, just to let you know, this meeting is being recorded. Um, I've got Connie, who's from my office, helping me out. She's in the background to, uh, to make sure everything goes okay. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Nico Church, um, and he's going to uh, introduce you to his team who are there to answer the questions in regards to this development. I know uh, many of you have concerns, and this is the opportunity to ask them. Uh, we did have a meeting before. The meeting before was um, before this went to planning committee. So now it's, uh, or sorry, it went to the planning department not committee. Um, this was not the, it had not been filed. Now it has been filed. So um, has there been much changes? Um, not that I'm aware of. I have not seen any from the preliminary meeting to now. Um, I had that preliminary meeting to give the community a chance to have input, um, but I don't see change on this. However, um, you can ask your questions. Okay, uh, Nico, it's, all, it's up to you now. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, just to quickly introduce uh, our, our project team, uh, Katie O'Callaghan and myself are planners with, uh, with Photon. We are the, the planners on this, this file. Uh, we also have Ryan Coolwine of Project One Studio. Ryan is the project architect. Matthew Mantle of Parsons is the transportation engineer for, for this project. Uh, and we also have Edward Hayes of Omnipex. Omnipex is the developer. Uh, and actually, before we get into our presentation, Edward, would you, would you just like to say a few words to, uh, to introduce uh, yourself to the community? Sure. Um, we do development uh, in Montreal, Florida, um, and in Ontario. Our primary market that we look at is 55 and older, and our specialty is uh, residential real estate. So while we've done a little bit of industrial commercial, uh, we primarily focus on residential. Uh, we build apartment buildings and we tend to keep them for a long time. The average building that we have, we've kept over 20 years. So our intent in general with the real estate that we build is we build it to keep it, and that's in our favor. So we build it right and we try to get the right tenants in the building as well. Thank you, Edward. And uh, as Edward noted, because they, they like to, to hold on to, to their buildings, they do want to be good neighbors to, to their community. Uh, so this is our, our second public meeting here and uh, we, we do as much as possible want to, uh, to, to find ways to address uh, the, the, any concerns or feedback that comes from the community. Uh, so with that in mind, um, I'll start by, by quickly sharing a presentation on the, on the context, uh, both in terms of the actual location of the site, as well as the policy framework. Uh, and afterwards, Ryan Coolwine will walk you through the, uh, the proposed project design. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Nico? Yes. Um, I, I was amiss to um, introduce the city planner on the file. This is the, uh, it's uh, Lisa Stern, who's here as well. I Hi. Thank you, Councillor. Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm the file lead on the application. We have received the application, and if you live within 120 metres of the site, you would have received a notice in your mail, or you may have seen a sign on site. Um, please send me an email if you have any comments, questions, or concerns. Your comments will be summarized in my report to Council and addressed. And as well, if you send me an email, I will, um, or by old fashioned mail as well. I forget that exists sometimes, but uh, you, I will include you on the mailing list. You'll receive notification of upcoming council meetings and any decisions on the application. Um, speaking at the future council public hearing uh, at planning committee and sending me an email or uh, correspondence also ensures that your appeal rights on the application are preserved as well. So I'll put my email in the chat and uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. My apologies. And uh, sorry to interrupt you, Nico. I just wanted to make sure people realize that when they ask questions related to um, what the city approves, uh, that, that is, uh, Lisa can deal with many of these questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Go ahead. Not a problem, Councillor. 
uh, just uh, making sure, uh, so I, I started my screen sharing. Is the presentation up? Can everyone see that? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, 3430 Carling Avenue, just to put everyone up to speed in terms of where we are. Uh, we had a first public meeting with, uh, with the community back in late June. I think it was June 22nd to be precise. That was before we submitted any formal development applications. Since then, about a month ago on August 16th, we submitted a zoning bylaw amendment application to permit uh, two nine-story buildings on the, on the site. Uh, so a zoning bylaw amendment application is, uh, is required when a development proposal deviates from the existing zoning provisions for a particular site. Uh, so these applications are reviewed by city staff, uh, by a variety of technical agencies. There's an opportunity for, for the public to provide some, some comments on these, on these applications. Uh, then it's reviewed by the city's planning committee and by city council for, uh, for approval or refusal. Uh, so there are mechanisms in place for zoning bylaw amendment applications. And uh, if, if you tune in to uh, the city's planning committee meetings uh, every couple of weeks, you'll notice that it's, um, it's, it's relatively common for, for these things to happen all throughout the city, whether they're, they are quite major rezonings of a particular site or sometimes it's just minor tweaks. Uh, so we have submitted a zoning bylaw amendment application. Uh, depending on the feedback from, uh, from the public, from the city, from the different technical agencies that review uh, our proposal, uh, if we are confident in what we're proposing that uh, everyone seems to be on board with, with approval, then we'll move forward with a site plan control application. So site plan control is a mechanism through which with the city, we look at a lot of the finer design details, whether it's uh, the landscaping, whether it's uh, the engineering, the, the mechanical equipment, uh, whether it's where garbage is gonna be stored and put out on garbage pickup days. Uh, it, it gets quite detailed and we really have an opportunity to refine the design details at the site plan control stage. Uh, after zoning bylaw amendment approval and site plan control approval, only after those approvals is the developer able to, uh, to pull building permits to actually uh, construct a development, uh, at least in this case where we're asking for both rezoning and site plan control. So right now we're quite early in the process. We're still at the rezoning process. This application would have to go through uh, through planning committee and eventually through council for approval. So uh, in terms of today's engagement, um, we've already had one public meeting, but it's still very early in the process because we, we just submitted uh, our application one month ago. So it's really an opportunity, uh, number one, for us to, to walk everyone through our, our proposed design, to talk about some of the feedback that we've received uh, in the first round of consultations and, and talk about how we've, uh, how we've considered these. Uh, and also to continue to receive feedback, to continue to, to receive comments from the public uh, as, as to what their thoughts are, what their concerns might be, uh, if they like certain aspects more than others. It's still early in the process and it's an opportunity for, for us to receive that as a project team. And also as uh, Councillor Kavanaugh mentioned for, uh, for city planning staff, for, for Lisa, uh, and her team to, to continue to, uh, to receive these comments as well. So in terms of the site, we're talking about 3430 Carling Avenue in the Crystal Beach neighborhood. So fronts onto Carling for a little over 140 meters. And the, the site is quite deep. It's about 45 meters in depth. So it gives us a lot of room to, to, to play around in terms of where we can locate uh, a sensitive development. Uh, altogether, it's, it's a little over 6,000 square meters in area. Currently, it's occupied by the Villa Lucia Supper Club, as well as a large parking lot. Uh, the parking lot has been used recently for uh, Department of National Defense employees who park here and then shuttle over to, uh, to the Carling campus down the road. In terms of the existing policy context, this site is, uh, is designated general urban area in the city's official plan. So the general urban area designation, uh, it does permit uh, a wide variety of uses. That being said, uh, the primary land use in this designation is residential. 
The general urban area designation also says that uh, the primary building heights will be low rise, that being four stories or less. So that's the official plan's definition of a low rise building height. It's four stories or less. It does provide certain conditions where greater building heights can be considered. And I'll, I'll touch on those uh, in, in a couple of slides because obviously here we're proposing more than four stories. Uh, very quickly, I'll also mention that uh, the site is located on Carling Avenue, uh, which is considered to be an arterial road in the official plan. So arterial roads are large roads that carry um, heavy volumes of, of traffic uh, and typically extend out to, to great distances and are, are very important uh, parts of the city's street grid. Uh, in our case, Carling Avenue, um, once it's, it's all built out, the, the city does want to protect for, for a greater right of way width. Once it's built out, the city envisions a 40, 44 and a half meter right of way width along Carling Avenue. And that includes traffic lanes as well as uh, sidewalks, there might be some trees along that, uh, that right of way as well. Uh, there's no detailed designs of that particular right of way now, um, but certainly they envision it to, it's already a very wide street, they envision it to be wider in its kind of final state. So as I previously mentioned, uh, in the general urban area, generally speaking, building heights are to be low rise, but in policy four, of section 361 of the official plan, which speaks to the general urban area. It says that new taller buildings may be considered for sites that fit one of two criteria. Number one is it fronts onto an arterial road and that it's uh, in a certain proximity of rapid transit, or it's in an area that's already characterized by taller buildings or sites zoned to permit taller buildings. So we front on our, our, an arterial road we are located more than 800 meters from the nearest rapid transit stations, about 1.2 kilometers from the future Moody station to the south. That being said, uh, if you look at a zoning map of the, the site and the surrounding area, immediately to the west and not too far to the east, there's two properties that are currently zoned to permit building heights up to 34 meters, which corresponds to a building height of roughly 11 stories, uh, sorry, roughly around 10 stories. So with these building heights, with this, this planned context, right now, those properties are, are low rise, uh, I believe around three to four stories. Um, that being said, they could evolve and be built out to 10 story building heights. So that, that allows us to consider greater building height. And again, with the property's depth, we felt pretty comfortable in designing a project that would be a little bit higher than the currently permitted six meters for this particular site. So this site's current zoning has a height limit of 18 and a half meters, which corresponds to roughly six stories. And it permits uh, quite a range of different uses, uh, whether it's uh, commercial uses, uh, employment uses, such as offices. Uh, it also permits a commercial parking lot on a, on a temporary basis, as I noted earlier. Uh, and it also permits uh, residential uses, which is what we are proposing here. So just quickly going through some of the feedback that we, we've heard so far. Uh, again, as I mentioned, in late June, we had our first community information session with, uh, with the, the public. Um, we really felt as though there was uh, quite a wide, wide range of opinions because we talked about two different options of, of building a kind of a fatter six-story building or a more slender nine-story design. Uh, there was certainly some support for greater setbacks from the rear lot line, as well as the below grade parking that we were proposing. Uh, there were some concerns noted with, with bird strikes and the need to adhere to the city's bird-friendly design guidelines. Uh, I would say that we're quite early in the process that uh, we don't have detailed designs that necessarily speak to that, but certainly through the site plan stage, uh, I'm sure the, the architect will be quite um, sensitive in trying to meet these, uh, these guidelines uh, where possible. Uh, there was also a, a desire among many residents to see some sort of uh, commercial use, such as a coffee shop on the ground floor of the building. Uh, we, we did talk about that as a team. Um, 
And there are pros and cons to, to having a commercial use on, on the ground floor. Uh, number one, you need to make the financials work. Uh, and right now there's not really a critical mass of commercial uses in the area. Uh, and the, the developers felt as though uh, it might not work. And so to, to have an empty commercial space uh, would be even worse. Uh, there's also some considerations that come with having a coffee shop in a, in a, re, a residential building uh, with respect to insurance rates or perhaps complaints from the residents that live in the actual building. Uh, perhaps uh, greater traffic generation as well, which would lead to um, a required increase in parking. So we considered the pros and cons and felt as though a strictly residential building would be more appropriate. Some of the other uh, concerns that, that we had, there, was, there were some concerns with the height of the proposed building, but again, we really felt as though there was a mix of opinions between people who preferred a nine-story building that was more slender or a six-story design that was uh, a little bit closer to the property lines. So we stayed with a nine-story design, which Ryan will walk you through uh, shortly. Um, there was a note about the development being used as a precedent for future developments. Uh, I just want to note that it's very important to, to remember that each development application is evaluated based on its own merits. Uh, so a development application um, that would be submitted nearby, if they were to talk about greater building heights, they would have to show that uh, they've met certain policies that are within the official plan and that they're also proposing a sensitive design. Uh, so it, again, important to note, uh, each application is evaluated on its own merit. Uh, and as, as we've seen, there are already two sites that are zoned to permit greater building heights as well. Uh, so we could very much see that in, in the future, but I can't speak to how those properties will for sure develop in the future. Uh, lastly, there were concerns relating to the environment uh, with uh, in intensification and avoiding further sprawl. Uh, we're certainly hoping that uh, the project that we're proposing will, will certainly help um, increase intensification and density uh, further within the city's limits instead of continuing to expand outwards and outwards. So very quickly, the project overview will have uh, two nine-story buildings, each with a height of 28 and a half meters, um, a total of 216 dwelling units, again, catering towards um, active seniors. Uh, so it won't be a retirement home per se, but uh, it will be geared towards retirement living. Uh, there's going to be a mix uh, of, of unit sizes, many of which will be two and three bedrooms. Uh, there will be 233 parking stalls for the building's residents, as well as 43 visitor parking stalls, most of which will be located underground. There will be some visitor parking on the, on the, on the surface located in between the two buildings. There's going to be quite a bit of private and public amenity space that will, or communal amenity space that will be uh, incorporated in, in the design and uh, quite a few bike parking spaces as well. So some of the zoning amendments that we're asking for are uh, an increase in the maximum building height from 18.5 meters to 30 meters, uh, elimination of the maximum floor space index. So the floor space index of two means that uh, you can propose a, a development with a, a floor area that is two times for the residents and the building will be marketed as such so anyone who wants to to rent a unit will know that there will be a limit on the number of parking spaces and lastly there there is a zoning requirement where a general mixed use zoned property needs to provide a three meter landscape buffer uh, from any abutting residential lot for a short portion of the lot uh, of the south lot line, we're proposing one and a half meters. Uh, given that this is a strictly residential site, we are uh, we are of the opinion that any impacts will be quite limited. We'll we'll do a, a, it's our intention to do a, a good job of landscaping and buffering that one and a half meters. 
spiders with with the fens with uh, some so there's also that in mind. Thank you, Nico. Um, give me one second here. <clears throat> Actually, I'm gonna keep it here. So um, Nico's done a good job in, in, I think, giving context to the project. And I'll just go through uh, um, in a little bit more, more detail for what has been felt very fortunate to have the opportunity to work on, um, given that it, it provides the opportunity to fill in what is currently uh, a vacant portion of Carling, you know, occupied primarily by a surface parking lot, um, but one that also offers a tremendous opportunity for a multi-unit residential building because of the proximity to the water, to the uh, water views, and, and really providing an opportunity for a project that could be quite unique um, in, this, in this part of the city. Um, our initial goals with this project um, was to be as sensitive as possible to the uh, to our neighbors to the south, um, and so this formed pretty good or a fairly significant driving principle in the way that we wanted to articulate the building, um, where we wanted to push everything as close to the street line as we could. Now we ran into opposition with this because we have, you know, if we look at the line here, the the, the front yard setback line, which is really where we wanted to orient the building towards. We, we had pushback from the city because of the road widening allowance that they would not uh, yield for this uh, particular excuse project. Me, excuse so, me, Brian. Yep. I can't let this go on. You keep talking about road widening, and I checked it out with our head planner. Um, they are not widening carling. I just want to make that really clear. Um, I've, I've got it here, and I'll give that response later. But um, please stop repeating that because it's not correct. No, no, no. There is no water Councillor, of car Councillor, do respect, but the city is taking that land back as part of a road widening allowance. Whether or not it's the street itself that's getting wider remains to be seen. But this is land that, as I understand, is being taken back by the city. Uh, Nico, well, is that road correct? Allowance, not road widening. All right. So. Oh, we are we, the, the building is forced to be pushed eight meters further from the property line from the front property line than was intended, which has a natural effect of pushing the building closer to the rear lot line than we had originally intended. That said, this line here indicates the rear yard, the minimum rear lot line, or sorry, the minimum rear setback at seven and a half meters. And the building at its closest point is 11.5 meters. So we are four meters further from the rear yard setback than zoning, um, than zoning would require. This is all a gesture again, to try to push the building closer to the street, to increase the separation that we see between um, the rear yard and then our neighbors to the south. In addition, the building steps in as we get above the fourth floor. So levels five, six, seven, and eight, nine are all pushed in so that the building becomes more slender as we climb. We have street facing units um, along Carling. Um, with generous balconies that offer potential for views towards the water towards the north. On the south side of the building, you can see in this graphic that these balconies are recessed and they're smaller. And as we climb up the building, the treatment for the balconies also becomes reduced. Uh, again, with, this in, with the intent here to reduce how far towards the south property line we're moving, to reduce overlook and to reduce privacy concerns. Now, Nico made mention of the rear yard setback or the landscape buffer reduction that we're pursuing. This is strictly for the area to gain access to the underground parking structure. The remainder of the rear yard is entirely green and will serve as amenity space for the residents. You can see the extent of planting that we're proposing here and trees. And this is because the line of the underground parking structure is actually set back off of the rear lot line. So this permits um, the planting of trees here, which would normally be quite cost prohibitive because we're on top of a parking deck and, and there's there's just some logistical challenges with planting trees in, in this type of configuration. So the intent here is to create a very dense green wall um, between the uh, development and the properties to the south. This access point here, as you mentioned, 
provides access to underground parking. So the only surface parking visible in the entire project are these parking, these 12 parking spaces that are visitor parking spaces really intended for drop off and pick up um, to serve the residents of the building. Otherwise, this is nearly entirely soft landscaping. So this will provide quite a bit of greenery to the site, quite a bit of greenery to the border conditions um, and, and have a drastic reduction in the amount of cars that are visible uh, from the street on the project. Um, moving to floor plans. So the general intent here um, is uh, lobby access from the street and then a series of one, two and three bedroom units as we move through the floor plate. These are very uh, generous suite sizes. So we have units that are over a thousand square feet, which are, are very, um, which, which are not typical to the industry um, and, a, and a good mix of units here. Um, bike and garbage storage on, on the ground floor. So there'll be plenty of opportunity for um, access to bikes, for servicing of your bikes um, and um, really um, providing good opportunity amenity for, for bike usage as opposed to simply having it in a, in a corner that isn't well serviced for, uh, for the residents um, of the project. Moving up the building, we have, again, a good spread of unit size, and we can see you know, the deep cutouts that we've got on the north side to provide ample um, outdoor private amenity space. So these are very deep balconies that would actually support um, you know, uh, placement of furniture, patio furniture. Uh, you know, you'd use this as a dining table or dining area in, in, the, in the summer months. And then we can see here that these balconies are, are certainly um, far less generous on the backside, again, trying to make them more slender and uh, to, to reduce the amount of overlook and privacy concerns to the south. Um, climbing up, we can see that the units get narrower. Um, on the fifth floor, we have an amenity room that empties out onto an amenity terrace on both buildings. Um, but in both, these are oriented towards the north side of the floor plate, and the outdoor terrace space is also on the north. So all of this, you know, uh, outdoor space here that would be amenity space that might, you know, gain a few more people are going to be oriented towards the north side of the floor plate, again, to increase that separation uh, from the property line to the south. Um, again, going up here, so we can see this is a little bit more slender profile, and then an outline of the balconies that we've got here, which are, you know, kind of a, a playful architectural articulation that we've got, and we'll get into explaining the, the architectural design in, in just a moment. Um, moving down, so this is the first level of underground, or sorry, the second level of underground parking. Um, sorry, P1 level. Um, so we can see the very efficient parking uh, configuration here, uh, two levels of underground parking, again, with the idea to get as much of the parking underground as possible and to get as close to the zoning requirement for parking as possible so that, you know, we, we exceed a one-to-one -one parking ratio for the residents um, and that we don't encumber the site um, with parking on the surface so we can leave that back to green space. Um, just looking at some calculations here. So, you know, overall area for the building is uh, around 200,000 square feet, uh, sorry, uh, gross floor area calculations here, and then front yard setback. So I just wanted to point to um, total amenity being provided for the project. So uh, total amenity area required versus provided. So we're, we're actually exceeding by a fairly large margin, both the um, communal amenity and the private amenity area that's required for the project. Um, we're meeting the bicycle count requirements. We have a very good spread of larger suites as opposed to smaller suites. So again, geared more towards um, bigger units, not smaller units and, and tenants that will likely be in the building for longer periods of time. Um, now, with respect to the design of the building itself, um, so we were very careful with how we moved our way through this. So going with a, a, a brick base or brick podium, um, you know, these masonry elements lend themselves to ideas of residential architecture, to ideas of permanence, to weight um, and reinforce in the street edge. Um, and then we step the building back above the fourth floor to create this datum line of four stories to really you know, kind of create this this impression of a four story volume. And then as we step back, we switch the um, vocabulary. So the method in which the building has been designed um, and the materials that we're cladding the building with to this very expressive staggered balcony or rank configuration. Again, these going towards the north, these are deep balconies with a, a fritted glass treatment. So they will be standing out to be visually predominant in the elevation of, of the building here to really focus on this, this uh, playful pattern that we've got on the upper levels. And with the amount 
of glass, this is going to feel very light in, compar in comparison to the heavier um, masonry volume that we've got on the lower levels. And even these brick volumes here still have very deep recesses um, because of the balconies here. So this certainly is not going to feel like a flat building. This is going to feel like a highly sculptured building, um, you know, a really distinctive architectural intervention in this uh, for the site, um, you know, and, and a, a really, we feel a, a playful addition for uh, this, this stretch of, of Carling Avenue. You know, we're forecasting fairly extensive landscaping on the front of the building. Um, these suites that are at grade that are going to have terraces. So the idea is that, that this really becomes an animated and active uh, front of the building um, with quite a bit of attention paid to the way that we're, we're handling the mass uh, of the building in general. The entrances for the project are being uh, defined by these colorful uh, canopies that uh, highlight the entry points to the project. Um, and then we can get a, a good view here as well of the way these deep uh, balconies would work um, and providing recess and relief uh, for the lower levels of the project. This is a kind of an overall view um, from, from, uh, from the north, looking back down south towards the building, and we can see the way the staggered proportion for the balconies work, um, and, uh, and the contrast in the two uh, portions of the buildings, the, the podium and then the, the lighter levels above. Um, and then going towards this view here, so this is the, the south side of the building, so the back of the building. Um, you know, much more reserved with the articulation depth and the projections on the balconies um, on this level. And then moving up here, we've also scaled back the amount of glazing that is on this elevation as well. So, you know, suites have kind of a minimum requirement from code and for livability to, to have daylight in the units. But the balconies are, are don't project out from the building face nearly as much, and we have uh, a great deal more um, solid wall on the south side than we do in comparison to the to the north wall. So we're making a lot of efforts here to try to be respectful um, to the existing housing uh, to the south, um, while while trying to make the make the most of the uh, opportunities that this project does afford with the views towards the north. Now, with respect to um, zoning or sorry, area calculations um, and what we're what we're terming as of right calculations, the study that we did was taking the minimum front, rear, and interior side yard setbacks, and then going to the um, permitted building height based on the zone. And when we run that calculation, we get the area that's defined in this purple box here, and that gets us to uh, 27,000 square meters. The analysis of this volume led us to con conclusion that a single building that ran the entire length of this frontage would not be conducive to good architecture, good urban design, um, or frankly, a, a, a good allocation of the site. There'd be too much building. There would not be enough um, daylight penetration. There would not be enough opportunity for green space on the site. So by adjusting the volume and redistributing height, what we're proposing with this project is to go much, much narrower than zoning would uh, than, than, than we'd be otherwise permitted to based off of um, the strict definition of the zoning bylaw. And we're reallocating that, that buildable area uh, as additional height for the project. So, you know, we, we've got these bases, but the building steps in and the net result of this is a building that while it's three stories higher is considerably less area than what we would other be able, otherwise able to build if we strictly followed the buildable envelope based on uh, those two metrics from the zoning bylaw. Um, so ultimately, we feel like the proposal that we've got in front of you represents um, kind of a greatest and best use for the site. It does ask for um, a, a bit more height on the on the site, but in return, we're able to provide buildings that we feel are much more becoming of the site and that provide a much better asset and resource to the community at large. Thank you, Ryan. Is that the end of the presentation? From the architectural component, yes. Nico, okay. I don't know if there was anything else. Yeah, yeah. Nico? You're on mute. Sorry. Note that's all we, we have nothing else to add. We're happy to open it up to questions and comments at this point in time. Great.
Um, okay, we've got a number of questions. Um, I'll just start off by asking, um, well, I know you got the, the response from the community, their survey that they did of their own residents. And I just wanted to start off with um, asking um, how you respond to, um, to that survey. Um, the main one being about the nine stories and if you're willing to offer alternatives. So certainly we, uh, we, we did get the, the results of the survey. Um, when we decided to proceed with a, with a nine story design, that was after our, um, our first public meeting. Um, and we thought that the, the response in, in the first public meeting was, um, was not um, necessarily dead set a, a, against nine stories. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some people would open that up to, to interpretation, but at least as far as a, uh, our project team goes, we thought um, a, a, some residents were, were more in favor of a nine story more slender design than, um, than a fatter six story design. Uh, so we decided to move forward with the, the nine story component. Uh, I will agree that uh, the, the, the consultations uh, that, that were provided to us were much more in, in favor of, of limiting the, um, uh, the, the building height. Uh, that was quite later when, when we were just in the process of, of submitting. So we, we decided to, to continue to move forward with, with a nine story design uh, in the hopes of continuing, to, um, continuing the conversation with the community. Okay, um, we have a question about, um, this is more for, for Lisa, um, about developers, can they explain how they deal with the extra load of storm and sewage systems? I, I see, Art, that you're saying to the developers, but this is something the city looks after, so I think I can have Lisa explain, because um, there, uh, as you mentioned, there's a concern of flooding in the immediate area. Correct. So uh, as part of a complete application, the applicant was required to submit a, so a storm and servicing study. And that's currently under review by our infrastructure department right now. And part of that is certainly looking at capacity of those of those services. Okay, thank you. Um, Anita's asking, um, uh, has the property sale been finalized? I think you mean from the uh the Villa Lucia family? So the, um, we yes, have go ahead, Edward. Uh, it's Edward Hayes. We have a, a firm deposit on the, on the property and we have a, an unconditional uh, purchase offer as far as the, uh, the deposit. So we're moving ahead. Um, we're waiting to finalize some of the aspects. We have a, a, a delay to complete the purchase. So we're moving ahead with the uh, planning department uh, to get a project that we want before we complete the purchase. Okay. Um, at the last meeting, Ryan claimed that um, they could build up to 27,000 meters and um, you were emailed to get those numbers but never got a reply. The number he claimed was total, uh, okay, was false because this uh, site zoning is, um, is FS, um, sorry, e, uh, two. Uh, please explain why you are misleading our community, it's from Rick. So I think that's a reference to the, the, the floor space index requirement. Um, our understanding is, so, so the floor space index requirement, um, it, it does exist on, on a few sites throughout the city. Our, our interpretation of that has been that um, in our dealings with the with city planning staff, they prefer to move more and more away from uh, a simple floor space index requirement. Um, and instead, uh, when going through a rezoning uh, amendment, really looking at uh, kind of locking in a particular building design, which provides more certainty to, to the community. Uh, so, so I think uh, in, in our experience, uh, the, the city seems to, to be moving again more away from a floor space index, which, uh, I mean, we could build that floor space index of, of two uh, in various areas, various shapes. Uh, and so the city, again, seems to, to be favoring more so um, 
actually looking at the building envelope, approving that building envelope if they are in agreement with it, uh, and then moving forward uh, with, with, with that. So that again, there's uh, once there's a rezoning approval, there's more certainty that's built into what can or can't be developed on the site. Okay. Thank you. Um, this development uh, does not align with the current OP uh, because it is uh, not, if, if, it, uh, if you don't choose the six story and zoning, how does it fit in with the proposed new official plan? I think that's more of a question for, for Lisa, but I can say we, we don't have bylaws yet. The zoning bylaw changes because um, the proposed new official plan has not even been tabled yet. But uh, Lisa, do you have anything to add? Um, sure. So I, that's part of my review is ensuring that the application complies with the current official plan. As the application was submitted prior to the new official plan being adopted by Council, the uh, policies of the current official plan will apply. Um, and the applicant has stated in their planning rationale is, and as Nico discussed in his presentation, um, there's a policy in the urban area that speaks to permitting increased heights where there are lots that are zoned for um, taller heights than low rise building in proximity. So that is certainly something that I'm looking at in my review. Okay, thank you. Um, sh uh, shading analysis. Yes, that is standard. Um, um, has it been completed for nine stories uh, and the six story built? And if it's possible, can it be shared? Yeah, that has been done. It should be on dev apps, but hang on one second here and I will be so kind as to bring this up. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, I guess the, one of the nicer attributes with respect to building height would be the fact that um, we are to the uh, north of the majority of the proper properties. So that means that the shading, you know, being cast on the other side of the street shouldn't have an impact on the people immediately to the south of us. Um, so let's see here, my Zoom taskbar. So this is kind of a standard run of um, periods of time that we operate for doing our shading studies. So this is June 1st. Um, the red is the proposed shadow. And what you're going to see in here is the proposed shadow. And then there's another dash line here for the as of right shadows. That's this line right here. So the red line is, is the proposed building. Um, and the dash line is um, what's, what's proposed as of right based on uh, minimum setbacks. So if my computer can cooperate here. So as we move through the dates, so this is uh, 10 a.m. Um, the CDs are all June 21st. So this is 10 a.m., 12 p.m., 2 p.m., 4 p.m., 6 p.m. So we don't see any impact on any neighboring properties until well into the evening, so 8 p.m. Um, on in June. Um, September 8 a.m. we can see the cast of shadows obviously much longer because of uh, change of the height of the sun and sky. Um, two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock. So there really is no impact to the, to the neighbors here. Perhaps on the other side of the street there's, there's minimal impact, but not really. Um, and then if we go to December, um, we get some highly skewed shadow lines here. Um, but we can see where we fall at 11 a.m. and then 1 p.m. 3 p.m. and that's that's the end of the run that we're required to produce. The, so uh, if we were to do five just before uh, sundown, we'd we'd see a line of shadows likely extending out in this direction here. But you know the, the the point here is is in general this is very limited shadowing on any of the adjacent properties. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, get back to the chat. And if I may, Councillor, that shadow study, Ryan mentioned DevApps. So for anyone who's not familiar with that, um, any materials that are submitted as part of a development application are circulated. They, they can be access, accessed online. Um, I don't know if, if maybe uh, Connie from your office can, can find the link. I, I can try to, to find it as well. But all of these materials, the, the, the design, the, the different studies. Oh, there we go. Lisa shared it. Uh, so the development application 
folder online is accessible uh, to, to everyone. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get back to uh, where we left off. Okay, there it is. Um, um, uh, from Rick, um, can you not live with an FSI of two? Or is it 4A and 4B or 4A or 4B? So certainly I, I can speak uh, firstly to, to the policies of 4A and or 4B. We've, um, we've run across this particular policy inter interpretation a, a few times. And in our conversations with, uh, with, with city staff, as well as in, in our application on, on other sites, um, we feel as, as though, um, <clears throat> sorry, more than we feel as though it's been confirmed that it's 4A or 4B. We need to meet uh, only 4A or 4B. So that's the, the policy interpretation side of it. Uh, with, with respect to, to, to the density, calculations. Um, I, I, I can certainly appreciate that there's uh, a, a desire to, to limit the, the density. Um, on the flip side, we, we are looking to intensify the, the, the city more and more. And we're looking to, uh, obviously we want to place this density in locations that, that can handle it. In looking at, again, this particular site, um, and the setbacks that we can provide with, uh, with a nine-story nine building design, where in our opinion, uh, the impacts will be relatively limited, uh, we think this can be good, uh, a good site to support uh, more density. Uh, I understand it's, it's, um, it's something that you're gonna see more and more across the city uh, that changes afoot. We are looking to intensify across the city um, and I, I can appreciate that it's, uh, it, it does lead to, to a lot of change, but again, we feel as though this is an appropriate site for that. Okay, thank you. Um, I was asked about um, the car carling widening and I did um, reach out to um, Aaron O'Connell, who's the manager of development review uh, for the West End. Um, so um, carling is identified as having 44.5, meter right away in the official plan, which would necessitate the dedication of approximately 7.5 meters from the front of the site. And there are no plans to widen Carlin this time. If additional lands are dedicated from the property, that would be used for sidewalk and landscaping within the right of way and not for additional road lanes. So, so that is the response I received. And I would not agree to a road widening. Just to add to that, I would definitely be opposed. Um, okay, just seeing. Okay, okay uh, I think we've already answered that. Okay, can you please tell me where in the official plan you find that Carling West um, is de designated um, as an arterial road. Um, um, uh, Carling west of Bayshore designated as an arterial road. I believe it is. Um, uh, Lisa, can you confirm that? It is an arterial road. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. okay, the land you're referring to um, is, uh, is Lita Clay, um, which is extensively through the area. What is the depth of Lita Clay and at what level? Um. Geo, would we have a geotech? Would, would a geotech have been done for this, Nico? Do you know for a zoning application? Likely uh, not. I, I'm, I'm trying to. Let me let me just have a quick look. Certainly, a geotech uh, technical application. Uh, okay, so it has not been done. It was not required by the city for a simple rezoning. 
uh, as we go for a site plan control application down the road when we are actually proposing a more detailed design and, and construction. Certainly a geotechnical study we expect will be required. And so the, the study will determine uh, the quality of the soil, what kinds of construction we can do, um, and, and what kinds of materials that we will have to use to, um, to, to construct a, a building that is safe. So it, the, that information is, is not available at, uh, at this time. Again, as we haven't uh, yet uh, submitted a, a geotechnical study. Thank you. What is the height of the builds in the setback area? It's from Ellie. Um, so we're at, what is it? We have, we have a, a terrace at the top, at the fifth level. So we have four stories there. So that would be give or take uh, 20 meters to the top of the fifth floor. And then um, what we're saying for the overall building height was 28, 29 meters. No, that math doesn't work. Bear with me for a second. It's Monday. It's okay. Do you want a minute? <laughs> I can go on and come back. Yeah, let's do that. All right. Okay. Um, and while you're doing it, what, what do you mean by amenity space? Is that a common space patio? So amenity space refers to, uh, it's, it's a zoning requirement that speaks to uh, active or passive recreational am amenities uh, areas for the enjoyment of residents. Uh, there is private amenity space and uh, communal amenity space. So uh, for an apartment building development, normally it's six square meters per, uh, per unit of amenity space that is required at least half of which needs to be communal. Uh, so as part of this development, we are proposing a variety of communal and private amenity spaces. Private would be in the form of uh, private unit balconies and, and terraces on the ground floor. Uh, in terms of communal amenities, we, we do have um, a, a fourth story exterior amenity terrace as well as some, some indoor amenity spaces as well. Uh, I don't think, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think those have necessarily been programmed as of yet, but you can imagine it could be, uh, it could be a gym, it could be a party room, that kind of thing. Yeah, we, for the indoor amenity spaces, that's exactly it. It'd either be a fitness center or lounge or space, something, something like that. The outdoor space would likely have some barbecues and, and just a, an area for potentially larger gatherings, um, you know, for you know, sharing a meal with some friends, let's say, that you didn't want to have into your unit. Um, with respect to building heights, uh, 27.5 meters is the proposed height, and that allows for additional stuff, sloped insulation, that kind of thing for the overall. So that's the, the total building height. Um, at the top of the podium, we're above podium, or sorry, we're at, at, at the top of the four-story podiums so that give us a building height of approximately 12.25 meters. Okay, thank you for looking that up. Um, Kevin Brewer, I'm going to get back to your question at the end, okay? Um, from Art, um, do you really think that 12 visitor parking spots is enough for two nine-story residential buildings? Um, their con the concern is about parking in the neighborhood, that people will come and use parking on the streets in the neighborhood. So just to be clear, we are proposing um, 12 visitor parking spaces on the surface, but we're actually looking to provide a total of 43 visitor parking spaces, uh, many of which would be located in the underground garage. Uh, this is a, a, an amount that um, it, it, it corresponds to 0.2 visitor parking spaces per unit. That's the, the highest possible in the city actually. Uh, and we meet that requirement. Uh, again, with 43 visitor parking spaces. So, so the 12 is, is just on the surface, the balance would be located underground. Okay. Okay, um, I'm reading comments. So I'm gonna skip comments and go to questions. And uh, I'm sure that you'll look at the comments, uh, Nico, with your team. We can, um, we can make sure you get them. Okay. Um, just looking to see if there are question in here. Yes, uh, from Kate. Um, the building architecture uh, could go in any location. Um, have you thought about uh, nautical references, any recognition of the location near the sailing club and the river? 
other developments in the area have done so. Uh, you know, just putting in windows and balconies doesn't make it specific to the location. Yes, we have observed that other buildings have gone with nautical themes. Um, we instead chose to articulate the program um, and the design of the building to make the most of where the project sits and what it's in proximity to. And we feel that this is a more appropriate response architecturally um, than to try to tie in nautical themes for the project. Okay. Um, okay, there's many comments and I'm just looking for, okay, Lita Clay leaves buildings unstable. What actions will the company take to stabilizing uh, a building of nine stories? Okay, so, so from the geotechnical assessment, we'll be able to determine the extent um, of Lita Clay on the site. We'll be able to determine how deep it runs, if bedrock is achievable at a in any way feasible depth. Um, if we are forced to construct a building on Lita Clay, there will be extensive sto soil stability measures taken into place, which can include raft slabs, it can include um, piles, it can include caissons, it can include any number of things uh, in order to achieve proper bearing. Um, something for everybody to keep in mind is that, you know, approvals, regardless of approvals, um, you know, uh, an engineer, a structural engineer is going to need to sign off on the, the feasibility of this project and, and, you know, the design criteria that we've got. And those are all based on um, what we call the bearing capacity of the soil. Um, so if we have really poorly performing soil, um, at that point, we'll either need to do an assessment to enhance what needs to be done in order to get the bearing capacity up to where it needs to be for building of the size or the project just simply doesn't go ahead. So in no condition will we be in a situation where we have, let's say, unstable soil that we're, that we're building this on. There, there's, there's no risk uh, in that regard. Okay. Um, if you, uh, the question is, um, to truly demonstrate your desire to be a good neighbor, would you please remove the, first, the top five stories from your proposal and resubmit your plan? I mean, I'll take that as a comment more than than a question. Yeah, yes, it's a it's would you so that's why I. Well, I mean, certainly, certainly one thing that I can mention is uh, with with respect to to the zoning right now, we are permitted to go up to to 18 and a half meters. Uh, so as as of right, the developer would be permitted to go up to six stories. Yes, that's correct. But I think they were commenting on the fact that of the design. Okay. Um, yeah, certainly we, we can continue to, to refine the, the design to, to hopefully uh, address uh, these, these concerns. I, I would argue that simply lopping off a, a few floors, I mean, certainly um, I'm sure some people will be in favor of that, but I, I think there, there are other ways of, of coming up with, with a more refined design that everyone could be happy with. Okay, uh, this is a recurring theme. Um, are you already considering lower height alternatives? So if I could just add, um, you know, I, I, I live in a neighborhood where half a block away, there's proposals for 30 story towers. Um, you know, I, I'm certainly um, sympathetic to the concerns of, of the residents that are worried about height and density in the neighborhood. Um, the thing I, I'm sorry, I don't want to come across as pushed in any respect here because I, you know, I live in Ottawa, I grew up here. I'm, I'm cognizant of urban, you know, development considerations. Um, the thing to remember is, is before, <laughs> before we were in the pandemic world that we were in, the majority of any discussion having to do with um, the development of, of downtown of Ottawa, of accommodation in general, was the housing crisis that we're current that we're still in. Right? This is something that hasn't gone away. Um, I also spoke in planning committee hearing, we were talking about the urban boundary extension. Um, and there were over 100 delegates that spoke to the fact that they wanted to see no increase to the um, urban boundary line in the city. 
this was something that the city kind of had a um, moderate approach to, right, where we saw a modest increase to urban boundary. But in general, there was widespread um, approval, or I shouldn't say approval, but, but um, desire to go to a line in the sand, don't expand the urban boundary. And what was being made clear at that point is even for the moderate expansion, you know, there's going to be pockets of intensification and more than pockets in just about every, you know, existing mature neighborhood, we're going to see fairly significant intensification in order to hit any of our density targets. And so while I understand that there's hesitation towards seeing additional height in what is currently a vacant site, you know, that's, that's occupied primarily by a surface parking lot, we do need to ask ourselves what are appropriate sites for development? Um, what are sites for development where efforts are being made to reduce the impact on the existing housing and the existing residential housing stock that is in that neighborhood? And is that proposed development being mindful of these considerations? And I, I you know, we, we've worked very hard to look at the massing, the orientation, the location of these buildings to ensure that the impact here is minimal. And in looking at the site, you know, this, this really is a site that is intended for, for bigger development than simply three or four stories. Okay. Obviously, the community doesn't have to share your opinion. No. Um, yeah. Um, is there a diagram that shows the shadow of the buildings? Uh, you showed you showed it. Uh, is there like uh, showing a... I guess a more three-dimensional one, perhaps, is what um, Eric. No, the, the 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 method of of the study that we do here is to do a top-down projection so that it's it's most clear what the shadow line for the building and then the shadow line for the as of right development would be, so we can compare those two. Okay, we don't have much time left, so please, uh, um, if you have any more questions, I, I would suggest you write them in because I will not be able to get to them. Um, we've only got ten minutes left, so. Um, I'll just try and uh, go through the questions. Um, uh, one of the concerns is about the rapid transit because it is not close to the site. It's uh, roughly two kilometers away. I've measured it too. Um, and how is that part of the rationale? So our, our rationale was, wasn't uh, actually predicated on proximity to, to rapid transit. We, we did recognize that there was uh, a, a fair distance from the uh, from the nearest planned rapid transit station. Uh, our rationale again was was focusing on the the planned possible context of the area, which may see uh, some nine to ten story developments uh, abutting or in proximity to to the site. Uh, I, I will note a, a couple of things. Uh, number one is that there is a good proximity to, uh, to, to cycling paths uh, in the nearby area, especially along the Ottawa River, uh, as well as the fact that um, there's a, a certain point where if, if you build it, the, they will come, they being OC Transpo. So if there's a certain demand for greater public transit, certainly OC Transpo would most likely follow up with that uh, in, in due time. Uh, so, no, our, our rationale was never focused on, on rapid transit, recognizing that it, it is some distance away. Uh, that being said, uh, again, we're hoping that uh, being located inside uh, in, uh, on the inner city portion of, of the green belt, that there's greater proximity to, to services through, for instance, cycling and shorter uh, uh, distances through, through regular public transit. Okay, thanks. Um, Connie's reminding me to leave a couple minutes for Lisa at the end to explain the process. Um, thank you very much. Peter in Virginia, I love your question and I was gonna ask it, so I'm glad you did. Um, have you given consideration for affordable housing? And if not, why not? I, I, I can only speak as a planner here, and Edward, I, I might toss the, the question to you. The, ultimately, the, the decision rests with, with the developer in terms of, of providing affordable housing or, or not. I would certainly say that providing um, a, a greater supply of units, uh, part of the housing crisis right now in Ottawa and the, uh, the in, insane prices that we're seeing for, um, for residential living, Part of it is a lack of supply. So this will certainly contribute to making housing more affordable in general. I understand that the question um, is, is probably more so looking at 
uh, affordable housing being below market rent. So uh, Edward, is this something that- is uh, We're actually building another project right now and uh, we are doing it under the CMHC, under their affordable housing rules. And the whole project is intended as affordable housing. And we haven't looked at the possibilities for this project yet, but it, it's definitely a possibility to have part of it as affordable housing. I would love to work with you on that. That is a consideration because, um, especially if you have larger units, because that is an issue that much of the affordable housing is small units and um, affordable housing tends to be more for families and uh, on usually on lower floors so that families can live in this neighborhood. Yeah. So um, uh, anyway, we can talk more. Yeah. Um, will the, as well, the, the size of the units lends itself to affordable housing as well. We have a lot of large units in the buildings that are planned. Yes, that's that's what I'm after. Um, our, uh, the, that it's, it, it suits the best for affordable housing. Yeah. And by the way, just so everyone knows, the definition of affordable housing, it's not social housing. This is affordable by CMHC standards, which is actually, uh, for some people, surprisingly not that affordable sounding, but it is capped. And um, anyway, I can give a fuller explanation, but this is um, what's going forward. And it's based on average incomes um, that you don't spend 30% of an average Ottawa income. And as we know, Ottawa incomes aren't that low. So, so it's, it's still, um, it's, it's working families, families uh, so mostly with, uh, you know, people with two jobs um, in the household. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hayes. Um, will the trees be proposed to be planted around the property be small or medium height? Also, with the parts of the building that are white, will it be solid white so it looks like, uh, okay, so it looks quite bold compared to the brick part? That's two questions, really. It is. Um... With respect to the parts of the building that look white, they they render white. The intent is that they're actually what we call anodized aluminum, so they're they're very much silver in appearance um, and not white. Um, white just tends to not look all that great as a metal panel over time, um, and we certainly want these buildings to look their best for as long as possible. Um, with respect to the planting, you know, we always like to see as, as large a caliper tree as we can. Obviously, that isn't going to impact the structures being planted around the building. Um, Nico, you can just shake your head. Is the landscape plan, is that part of the zoning application? Yeah, okay. So we'll be working with the landscape architect then to, to get a, a good spread of trees here. Like the intent is to offer some, you know, um, vegetation that has some verticality. We don't just want to see hedges and shrubs and stuff here. We, want, we do want to see some trees that are going to carry some height. Um, and we'll work with the city on that one as well, just to see how big a tree we can plant in front of the buildings. Okay. Um comments about purchasing a home um, uh, from, from Chris. I'll let you read that. Um, in the last meeting, you gave the community a choice of six story versus nine story. Um, so um, when you knew the FSI um, equals two would not allow this, why did you mislead the community? I think we were um, we were looking to to propose two different types of development with with, with the understanding that the the city uh, a, a appeared to be moving away more and more away from the actual uh, FSI requirement, which um, which in my opinion can perhaps prohibit good design options. Uh, so if uh, if the the community felt uh, misled by that. We 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 apologize, but uh, in our mind, the FSI was was something that um, I guess in our understanding and, and experience, uh, the city would simply move away from and focus on just a good building design. Okay, okay, all right. I will respond to Kevin's question. Um, Yes, I, I see the concerns in the community and, and I share the concerns, though um, I have slightly different concerns. One of them is the fact that um, when we're building um, in neighborhoods, we should be looking at transit-oriented development. 
Um, given the car ratio, it's very clear this is not intended for transit oriented develop whatsoever because the station is quite far away. In fact, even to go to D&D, there's not even a complete sidewalk along Carling to get there. So people are going to be using more cars. I don't consider this uh, a step forward for climate change when we're building um, exclusively to encourage people to drive. Um, there is no um, there is no 15 minute neighborhood part of it, um, particularly because there's no commercial part where people can go downstairs or pick up something. That is not part of it. So people will be driving. There'll just be more people driving. That, that is what I'm seeing here. And I have big concerns about that. So um, I, um, I know intensification has to happen. Intensification on Ontario is, is the way to go. However, this does not meet the criteria of being close to uh, amenities. And um, it just encourages more people to get on the road. I totally, totally oppose uh, having any uh, widening of carling. Um, we need more bike paths. We need one on the south side. We need more wider sidewalks. We need to make it, keep it walkable. That's what the neighborhood needs. Um, so, yeah, so I have concern because it, it doesn't fit into what I thought we were doing as an official plan uh, moving forward. And um, so that's that's where I am on it. So um, Lisa, can I give you the last words on the process, please? Thank you, Councillor. So the city is at early stages of reviewing the application. Um, I'm certainly having a look, as I mentioned, at the policy context, including is the density and intensity that they're proposing appropriate? Is it compatible with surrounding developments? Our transportation department is reviewing the application, parks, um, along with many other reviewers. Um, again, in a notification that was sent out, I believe the date was September 30th, to send in your comments by. But feel free to send me comments at any time um, until notice of public hearing, uh, until the application is ready to go to um, planning committee. But the earlier that you send them, the more chance that the ap applicant will incorporate them into their review. We have no timing as of yet for this to go to planning committee. Um, however, I would think um, late winter into next year would be a realistic timeline. Again, if you send me your comments and your address, I'll, I'll ensure that you receive notification of that upcoming meeting and you can speak at it and if you wish and you'll receive um, directions on how to do that should you wish to. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, I did put my email address in the chat. All of the information um, including plan shadow studies, traffic impact assessment is available for you to review on dev, dev apps as well. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, uh, I've been asked to answer Margot's question, which is about um, compensating people in the neighboring properties for reduction of market value um, in regards to making a maximum profit. And uh, this is for the owners of the property um, uh, I'm going to give that one to Lisa in terms of just um, policies on, on such things, because it certainly has come up before. Give me the hard ones. Yes, I um, do. <laughs> <laughs> that is not something that the Planning Act covers. There's no uh, mechanism for compensation of landowners. I think that property values being impacted um, often can be a very subjective um, subject and uh, it's not something that the city um, or developer typically would do. But there is a question I can ask in terms of, uh, of cash and loot because of compensation of using up the land. So. So um, is the developer? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I, so we certainly do require um, parkland dedication with every application that is su submitted. Um, and that is generally about 10% of the, the 
the land, either as actual land or cash in lieu of parkland. Um, and that's based on the city's parkland um, dedication bylaw. Also, the applicant will have to pay development charges. And uh, one of the things I'm looking right at right now is uh, community benefits through Section 37. And if that would apply in this case due to the proposed increase of intensity on the site. Yeah. Um, in the, and what that means is um, monies can come and be used in the community. So, um, for example, in, enhancing the park or whatever, but um, that that is something that can be negotiated. So, um, so that that is the that is the answer. No, there's no mechanism for compensating properties, and um, and I'm sorry to give you that answer, but that's that's what it is. Anyway, thank you. Um, lots of good questions. And um, as Lisa said, you can uh, you can send her more. You can copy my office so that I'm aware of. You can will we'll, and it will be shared um, with the development team. And I want to thank them all for coming out tonight and uh, answering some very tough questions. Um, I want to thank the community for asking tough questions. That's what you should do, and um, and find out what's what's going on. So. Uh, Anyway, um, we'll certainly keep you informed on next steps as always through our Bay Ward Bulletin. We will keep you posted on, you know, when it's ready to go to um, planning committee. I do have one, oh, uh, one question, urban design review panel. Um, will that be going through that at all? Lisa, is that something, not all of them do, but. No, it's uh, not within a design priority area. So this one will not be going to the urban design review panel. Okay. Yeah, that's another layer if, um, but it's, uh, it just gives comments on the design. So that won't happen. All right, thank you. All right, um, so we'll certainly keep everyone posted. Thank you. And um, no, this is the public meeting. Um, this is actually over and above. Um, strictly um, speaking, um, the public meeting is the, the meeting when it goes to planning committee. I have put two extra meetings, one before the application was even filed and one now that it's filed. So um, it's not, no, there's not going to be further, but it's still the door is wide open on asking questions. Okay, thanks very much. Take care, have a good rest of the evening.